All right. Welcome everybody to session seven. Has it been that long? Um, of shift happens. That's episode seven, I should say. Um, let me give our my comments box open here. I see something flashing at me. Um, Margie says that she sees Facebook instead of Zoom. Kat, you see my PowerPoint slide now, right? I do, but let me see what I see from the stream, the Facebook stream. I shared my whole browser window. Let me just change it. I, I was, that was, I will just share PowerPoint. I was bounced back and forth. Okay. So now I, oh, thanks Margie. <laughs> Okay, so today we are going to dig a little deeper into what we covered on episode five was all the, all the financial resources available to help you through this. However, there's a lot of uncertainty in that space. Um, you know, I, I've been talking to CPAs, attorneys, business owners, bankers, and nobody seems to really understand what's going on. Somehow I've become the advisor for this. Uh, a lot of people are calling me, so I, I've, I've, I'm pretty well read in this space. I actually did visit a bank and I asked them to, you know, verify everything that I knew yesterday. So what I want to do today is just slow down a little bit. Instead of throwing everything that I threw at you in session five, if you want to know everything that's available to you as a real estate professional and you weren't with us uh, last Friday, go back to, you can find it on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash all the leads in our Facebook group, All The Leads Mastermind, probably on LinkedIn and then, yeah, everywhere else. But look for episode five of Shift Happens if you wanna see all of the personal and professional assistance that's available to you. Not all, but a good chunk of it. Um, we covered a lot in that, in that episode and I wanna slow down a little bit today because I'm realizing even people who you know, who are, are in business and they're used to, to, you know, writing contracts and dealing with more complex things. They just, people are having a hard time wrapping their head around this. So I want to slow down and look at the facts, not all the stuff that you see on the news. And just to remind you guys, I try to do all my research independently. So I'm going to, you know, the Federal Reserve, I'm going to the SBA, like I try to source these things because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and unfortunately, even stuff that the government is printing, like in these credible sources, it's changing, like there are changes happening. So for, for example, last Thursday night, the, the paycheck protection program loan application became obsolete and many people don't know that. So I'm going to show you exactly what to do for the, these two programs. We're going to focus on the EIDL and PPP. And we're just going to slow it down a little bit and go through it step by step. So I know that you're prepared by Friday. Everybody on this call will be eligible to apply for both of those. So I just want to make sure that you guys have what you need to actually take action on this, not just to hear about it and get overwhelmed. Cause I've seen a lot of people do that. Most of the folks I've talked to are like, Oh my God, it's just too much to hell. It's just not worth it. And what I don't want to see you do is leave two months of free payroll and $10,000 on the table just because you didn't quite understand it or your CPA didn't understand it or your banker didn't understand it. And I don't have all the answers, but I have a lot more answers. I have a, I'm a lot clearer view on this um, than I did last Friday. I've pretty much dealt with it every day since. So anyways, let's jump in. Um, so today we're pretty much just going to cover the, the EIDL summary and how to apply and the PPP summary and how to apply. Um, and again, hope I don't need this, but I, you know, I'm giving you this information for, for your benefit. You need to assess your own risk and cover your own assets. You should talk to your own advisors. Um, the things we're proposing is technically debt. And if you're going to take on debt, you need to be aware that you're making your own decisions. I'm just trying to help you understand it. Um, so let's first look at the EIDL or the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. This was an existing loan program that's been part of, of the SBA for years. Typically, it's deployed in floods, hurricanes, um, you know, other natural disasters. So they decided to repurpose this and make it the vehicle in, in order to rapidly deploy cash down. Um, 
the the loan before it was was retrofitted uh, is open from January 31st through December 31st. They were looking at a 25 to 35 day business ter- turn, uh, two million dollar loan amount. It's used for fixed debts payroll, yada yada. And this is collateralized only over 25,000, meaning that any a loan amount. Um, Kat Sylvia said she lost sound. Are you, are we okay? I hear you fine. Okay. Sylvia, it might be bandwidth on your side. Um, so the first $25,000 is not collateralized and the first $199,999 is not personally guaranteed on the, the traditional loan program. These are three and three quarter interest, 30 year AM with a 12 month payment deferral. Now, as part of this, um, there's another provision that was written into this, and this is technically still a loan, but it is a forgivable loan for up to $10,000 per business. Now, if you do the math, $10 billion worth was allocated to this program, up to 10,000 per business. If, if, every, if the business has got the, the 10,000, then that means only a million people. There are 35.2, small, 35.2 million small businesses in the United States today. 7.7 million of those are employer businesses, meaning they have more than one employee, more than two employees. Um, so the vast majority of them are people like us, real estate professionals, single, single member LLCs, um, you know, S corps, things like that. So a lot of people are going to be reaching out for this. We have 35 million businesses and about a million can actually get the 10,000. Now, what happens is basically they've allocated right now 10 billion and they've said they would continue to push money, but that hasn't happened yet. So it's likely this program is already uh, beyond its, its allocated resources. However, it's not working the way that they expected. The way this was supposed to happen is they would use the EIDL loan program as a distribution channel which would allow them to very rapidly deploy up to $10,000 per business through an ACH uh, electronic transfer within three business days of receiving the application. <clears throat> My application has been in for over a week. I think it was last, uh, <clears throat> last Monday night is when I put mine in and I've gotten nothing, not as much as an email. All I have is a screenshot of my confirmation number and so far, everybody, and I've talked to hundreds of people who have also applied from multiple entities. Nobody's hearing anything. The banks are not associated with this. Um, SBA is just choked and, and can't really answer my questions. So not, I, and like I said, I've talked to tax attorneys, CPAs, um, financial advisors, nobody knows. So in theory, you can get up to $10,000 for your business. There is some talk that they've, they've you know, it was written as, pretty simple language if you look at the actual bill, but there's not, they're now kind of backpedaling. SBA is now backpedaling saying, well, it's up to $10,000. Some businesses might get a thousand. It's really relative to the number of employees you have. So nothing more specific than the bill has been published by the, the SBA. Um, there's a lot of speculative stuff that has been published by parties that like stuff that I'm not going to hang my hat on, but the way it looks right now, there, there still could be an opportunity for you to get a $10,000 cash infusion into your business. That is, it's a forgivable loan. So it's essentially a government grant. They're issuing it through an existing loan program, but it's, it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably a duck. It's a government grant. Um, there's no real underwriting. Like they're going to ask you, they basically ask you for last year's revenue, last year's cost of goods. So this is being considered when you apply, if you apply for the Paycheck Protection Program loan, um, this is being considered. So the $10,000 is, is considered, and I'll show you later where that is in the application. Now, let's take a look at the EIDL application. This one's very simple, and I'm gonna have to change my screen share over to the browser. All right, Kat, can you confirm you have a browser window now? Yes, I do. Okay. So one thing I want you to look at up here in the, in the top right, you see OMB control number 32450406. The, this is for the EIDL. This number is very similar on the Paycheck Protection Program. It's just going to be 0407. Because they are changing applications, like 
yeah, you want to make sure that you're doing the right paperwork. This is directly from the SBA. So it's COVID-19 relief.sba.gov forward slash hashtag forward slash. And I'll drop this for you guys, uh, for everybody who's joining us on Zoom. Um, I will drop this and Kat can probably get it to everybody on Facebook. So this is a very simple five-step application. Um, most of you are gonna apply as a business with less than 500 employees or as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor or self-employed. The, the good news here, these programs have been extended to include basically everybody. So you pretty much need to focus on one of these first two buttons <clears throat> and then say you're not a criminal, um, basically opt in, like just answer these questions, jump to continue. Now here, because I chose that I was a business, it's asking me for the business information. If you fill it out, as it's, this is a, a dynamic form. So if you are not a business owner, then this form will update and it'll ask you for more personal information. Um, it is actually pretty good technology and it has been holding up. This is something they put into play last week um, after their website just absolutely crashed on the original EIDL applications. So you're just going to put in your information here. What a, The only thing that you really need to focus on here is understanding what was your gross revenue for the last 12 months. Now, I'm shocked at how many people call themselves business owners and don't even use QuickBooks. They, they don't They don't keep books. Um, I've been guilty of that in the past, but I decided if I was going to be a business owner, I should step up and I hate bookkeeping. I hate payroll. I get it. But it's times like this where if you have, you know, if you are doing a stop, if you've established payroll and you're paying yourself as an employee and you have an entity, like it makes this so much easier for banks to underwrite you. However, a lot of people don't have that. The vast majority of small business owners do not do that. Um, so the SBA has been very gracious and the banks are being very gracious in what they're asking you for and the underwriting standards are very loose. Um, so you basically just need to put in your gross revenue for the last 12 months and cost of goods sold. Now, this is difficult for us. We're a service industry, right? So what are the goods? What is the cost of goods? And this is a gray area. For me, this is basically my, my business operating expenses. So it, you know, it, I have to have lock boxes and I have to have a key to open lock boxes and I have to have a cell phone and I have to have this and that. So basically whatever it costs for you to produce your goods or service, um, traditionally cost of goods and accounting is going to be, you know, it's not going to include everything, but for this, because this is a very, uh, I don't know, willy nilly, I guess, <laughs> fair term, they're just looking for rough numbers. So look at the, the gross revenue from last year and what your business expenses were from the last year and then you can roll through. That's about as complicated as this gets. Um, I timed it, my, my second one I timed, first trip through might've taken me a little longer, but it takes about six minutes to complete this application. Um, and that's not having everything in front of me. I had to bounce the Dropbox folders and find my EIN and all that, but this is super simple. And that was the, the intent was to make this really easy so it could be rapidly, rapidly applied for and rapidly funded. Now, the whole rapid funding thing is, <laughs> is not happening. So let me jump back to our, uh, our slide deck, guys. Okay. Uh-oh. It looks like PowerPoint crashed. So let me get our deck back up here, guys. Well, that's embarrassing. Okay. All right. Kat, can you confirm that now there is a slide back up? Yeah, it's back. All right. Okay. So we'll jump back in here, guys. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is our EIDL, and you can see how simple it is to apply to that. 
There is more uncertainty around this than anything right now. Uh, the SBA doesn't seem to be communicating with anyone. Uh, if you look on, on their webpage, they haven't published any new information. There's a couple of really simple paragraphs of copy and very few details. Um, there wasn't much published about this even in the bill. We're, uh, we're going to go through a lot of specifics on the Paycheck Protection Program Quite honestly, like, and I, I respect the people that are that are stepping up and and the leaders who are are you know coming to our aid, but this one is is a bit of a a mess, uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So, my best advice to you is go to and we'll post this link for you. We I shared it in the chat, but go apply for it. Um, it's they're not you know if, if you can you can so a lot of this is going to have to be sorted out and reconciled on on the back end. Um, because we don't exactly know exactly what all these programs are. So that is your EIDL. Um, next, we're going to look at the Paycheck Protection Program. And I think I might, this opened the wrong slide deck. Sorry guys, when PowerPoint went down, I think it reopened the wrong. No. Okay, so on the Paycheck Protection Program, this was a $350 billion program from the SBA. Um, it's for businesses with less than 500 employees and self-employed independent contractor gig workers. Um, the application period began February 15th and this will go through June 30th. So this one is a lot shorter term. Um, your target return times like to turn this around is 36 hours. Um, that's obviously not happening here either. Um, I do know a few people who have submitted applications they have processed, but they have not funded they applied as early as last Monday. So we're looking at more like over 10 days of turn time, even if you do everything right and you get it and you're on the top of the pile. The max loan amount for this is two and a half times your monthly payroll, up to $10 million. And the, the, the monthly payroll, if you, if you receive the EIDL loan or grant, that will be considered on your PPP application. Um, the uses of this are important. Um, this is a forgivable loan. However, you have to use, the uses will dictate what is forgivable and what must be paid back. The uses that are forgivable are payroll, wages, commissions, rent, mortgage, and, and utilities, with the caveat that no, no one can be paid more than $100,000. Uh, well, can be paid at a rate of more than $100,000 per year. So, for example, if you're an independent contractor and you, you're making $130,000 a year, you can only, the, the forgivable portion of PPP is only up to that $100,000 limit. The rest of it, you can pay yourself, but you're going to have to pay, pay that back. Now, it's a, it's a two-year loan maturity period. I've seen this misreported in several places, um, but this is from the actual document, document I will show you from the SBA. Um, so the, it's a two-year maturity. The payments are deferred automatically for the first six months with some language written in there that basically says this, at the SBA's discretion, you can, the payments can be deferred for 12 months, which I expect. Um, the interest rate, I've seen a lot of people posting 0.5%. Um, but when you look in the SBA interim final rules that, that we'll go through, sorry guys, I didn't even realize that the screen wasn't being shared. Hopefully, hopefully you see that now. Um, so the, the interest rate is 1% and the, the interim final rule that's published by the SBA. Um, forgiveness. So payroll uh, a payroll that, that meets, if, if you use it on, on payroll under $100,000, that will be, you'll be granted forgiveness for that. Um, and 25% of other things, depending on how funds were used. Now, 
no one is clear on the answer of how this will be reconciled. So basically, let's just say you get $25,000 and you pay yourself 12,000 and you pay for your internet and you pay for your lease payment. Um, and then you decide to buy, you know, some new office furniture because there's this amazing deal and you do that with that money. At some point, you're going to have to reconcile what went to payroll, what went to equipment, what went to utilities. And like, for example, in the office furniture, well, however that's reconciled, it's most likely going to be on your 2021 tax return. However, we don't know. We don't know if this burden is coming to the treasury, if it's coming to SBA. We don't know who's going to reconcile. It could actually come back to the bank to originate the loans, and you may have to reconcile with, with your local banker. That's uncertain right now. Um, according to everybody I've asked, including tax attorneys, CPAs, financial advisors, and personal bankers. Nobody knows. So at some point, you'll have to reconcile this. Worst case scenario, you're going to have a two-year loan at 1% interest. So it's not the end of the world. And your max loan amount is $10 million. But that's for most people on this call, your max loan amount is going to be under $50,000. So you should not worry about this, even if you break the rules, as long as you're not, you know, if you don't go out and buy, you know, buy something elite, you know, if you go buy a racehorse with the money and start betting at the track, then yeah, you're probably, you might get in some trouble, but if it's related to your business and you spend that money that you can show that it was, it was necessary for your business, you don't have much to worry about. It's going to convert to a loan at 1% and you've got two years to pay it off and a year of no payments. So don't get too wrapped up in, in the, the, you know, how you can use it. And it will, we'll let you know more when more is known about how it's reconciled. Um, so the really neat thing about this, rather than putting more pressure on the SBA local branches, they actually ran this through uh, the banking system. So the, the existing distribution channels for, for, you know, a lot of, for, uh, SBA loans, any lender who's FDIC insured that is that is capable of writing like the 7A the SBA loans can now take applications. And shockingly, they didn't even mess with web forms on this one. You literally take this package, you take paper, and you go to the bank. I, I finally had to leave my property yesterday for the first time in a month um, because I had to go to the bank finally. Uh, no email, no no web form. So. I'm going to walk you through this application package. I'm going to show you the things that I learned yesterday um, that I had, that I thought I had everything in order, but I didn't. Um, so my suggestion guys, the, the fee structure on these loans up to $350,000, the bank will get a 5% commission or fee from there. It goes down from three to one. So if they're writing a $10 million loan, they're still, they're only getting one point. So there's a pretty strong financial incentive for the banks who are originating and uh, taking these applications. So you guys heard me jump on my soapbox and cheer for community banks a couple of times throughout this series. I'm going to tell you, this is important. And if, if you're banking with one of these big banks where you feel like you're a number and they've already pulled these programs, I would encourage you to take a look at why I'm so, so supportive of community banks. If you understand the U S finance system, and if you understand how our, our broader economy works, you'll, you'll appreciate my support of community banks. And when times get tough and when you need help in your community, it's not Wells Fargo typically that, that's going to step up. It, it's, they're, they're not going to provide the same level of service that, that a community bank with a real relationship will. Um, there are, you know, big banks are serve, serve a great purpose, but for this, I strongly suggest you go to your community bank, keep this money in your community, support those people because they're going to be struggling through this too. Um, and it's not, you know, they can make more money on these than they can on mortgages right now. Um, now they're, they're singing for their supper. This is an easy work for them. <laughs> They've kind of had it handed to them. So you can apply. So independent contractors, self-employed uh, gig workers, et cetera, can start applying for the PPP as of Friday. So my suggestion is take the applications that we're going to give you today in the show notes or wherever this is posted, you'll be able to see the application, the most current one. 
um, get that filled out today or tomorrow. So Friday morning, you can drive to your bank and get it on the top of the pile. They literally have stacks of these paper applications they're trying to process through. And a lot of banks are doing this through their, their commercial, you know, through their, their business bankings. And there's two or three people in there, but they're getting it done. Like they're working around the clock. They're, they're taking this very seriously. So, if you're a business owner, if you, uh, you know, if you have an entity, you were eligible to apply last Friday and you're still eligible today for an independent contractor, self-employed gig worker, then your eligibility to your ability to apply begins on Friday, fr Friday at midnight, basically. So let's just call that 8 a.m., 7 a.m. whenever your bank opens. Um, now, to back this up, because there is a whole lot of stuff out there. I want to actually let me switch my share here over to a browser. I want to show you specifically this, what this is, this is the source. So there's a lot of summary stuff out there, but I wanted to actually take you to the actual SBA uh, paperwork. So this is from the, the SBA. This is the interim final rule that was issued. So this is the most current document that the SBA has actually published. And I've gone through here. I've, I've read this whole 31 page document. Um, and I've gone through and kind of highlighted some of the things that I believe are relevant to the people on this call. So these funds are made available through June 30th or until they're exhausted. And I would say that, that the, they will be exhausted before June 30th. Um, and as you can see in here, it says it may qualify for loan forgiveness. So the SBA can issue these loans through the 30th. They have $349 billion and it's guaranteed under their existing 7A program. You're eligible if you have 500 or fewer employees, as long as your principal place of residence is the U.S. Um, as long as you have been in operation since February 15th of this year and had employees that you actually paid salaries, payroll taxes, or you 1099 them. Um, you're also eligible if you're an individual who is a sole proprietor, an independent contractor, or self-employed as long as that began um, before February 15th of 2020. And you're going to be required to submit documentation. So if you don't have uh, a P&L on a balance sheet and payroll. If you don't have all that, they're going to ask you to see bank statements on how have you been paying yourself? How have you been getting this money? Um, but you're going to have to back it up. Um, next is how do I calculate the maximum loan amount that I can borrow? So this is a part that's confusing to a lot of people. So you're basically looking at whatever your payroll, the business's payroll costs are. And they, they've done a good job. They've actually given some examples that we'll look at. But you're going to take your, your payroll cost times 2.5% plus the $10,000 EIDL grant. And it's either that number is what you're eligible for or $10 million. If that number is higher than $10 million, then you'll qualify for $10 million. I will be shocked if anybody on this call has a staff large enough that they have over $10 million in payroll and less than 500 employees. So for pretty much everybody on here, you're going to take your monthly payroll expense times two and a half plus your EIDL uh, grant. And that will give you your amount. So let's look at an example of that. So example number one, you have no employees that are making over $100,000 in, in payroll or salary. So that gives you 120 grand in payroll, um, which is $10,000 a month for the company multiplied by two and a half is 25 grand. So your max loan amount for your business is $25,000. Even though the max eligibility is 10 million, you're being qualified based on your actual situation. Now, if you look at example two, or actually let's go to example three. So if you have no employees making over hundred grand, you, do have, you did receive the EIDL loan, that's the grant of $10,000. So you have your payroll 120 monthly, that's 10,000 bucks multiply times two and a half. That gives you 25 grand. Now they're going to add in the $10,000 EIDL loan. Note that they're not subtracting that they're giving you that in addition. So in scenario one, you only qualify for $25,000 on PPP and scenario three, because you did get the EIDL 10,000 that we talked about earlier, 
they're tacking that on. So your $25,000 eligibility goes to $35,000. Clear as mud, right? Um, and as far as payroll costs, so this is something that like this definition traditionally has not been this, this relaxed. So payroll costs consist of compensation to employees in the form of salary, wages, commissions, or similar compensation, cash tips or the equivalent, um, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, allowance for separation or dismissal, payment of the provision of, of employee benefits consisting of group health coverage, insurance premiums, and retirement, payment of state and local taxes based on compensation of employees, and for independent contractor or sole proprietor, wages, commissions, income, or net earnings from self-employment or similar compensation. So basically, any way that you can make money is going to be considered a payroll cost for the purpose of this loan. Now, if only the, the rest of the world worked this way. So basically, guys, it, they understand that not everybody has properly structured or operated businesses, even though they're effective and they represent a, a massive chunk of our GDP. It, they're not really most most people aren't running their business in such a way that it looks good to a banker. So to me, this is really encouraging. I'm actually proud of the people who who wrote put this into play so quickly that they were willing to make those exceptions. Um, so you're that like it seems like if you if all you can do is hand them credit card statements bank statements and your tax returns from last year like with your schedule c or your your 1099s um, or k1s like even if you don't have books you can just hand them this stuff and they'll be able to say okay and the banks the, the reason that this is so relaxed is because the banks actually uh, there's a hold harmless clause if I, and i've actually read through all the banking documentation too now i hadn't on friday but there is actually a hold harmless built in as long as the bank is not doing anything underhanded or illegal if even if these loans default if they never pay back then then there's a hold harmless they they basically and then and then and they're they're held harmless by by the sba so that's why they're they're being so generous in their underwriting standards, and which will speed this up greatly. Um, so, is there anything that is expressly excluded that you cannot pay as your payroll? That you cannot include as your payroll costs. If you have an employee making over a hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, only the first hundred thousand can be paid for with the PPP funds. Um, so Article H, do independent contractors count as employees for the purpose? This is important, guys. So the answer is no. For example, let's say you have a photographer, and that photographer is very loyal to you. They, they do freelance work, but for you, you're paying them $50,000 a year to do all your drone videos and photography and everything. But you pay them on a 1099. You can't count that, even though that's an expense of your business. It's not that that that's a payroll. It's not in your cost of goods. Um, this person is eligible for PPP, so you should not be counting them as an employee. You can think of this as like kind of filing your tax return and claiming someone else's kids as your dependents. So the, you need to make sure you understand what an employee means. If somebody is supporting your business as a contractor but they are eligible for PPP themselves, then you are, you cannot count them as a contractor. Now it's things like this where you can unknowingly create some liability for yourself. It may look fraudulent. The, the risk of you actually getting in trouble doing this is, is, is low. But if you go out there and list all these contractors as employees to pump up your payroll numbers, just to get a bigger check for yourself, even if that money is going to them, technically they should have applied on their own. It's not your place. You're not technically their employer. So just make sure you understand that. Um, the interest rate on the PPP is 100 basis points or 1%. And like I said, this has been published in several places as a half percent, but this is the official document from the, the SBA. So I'm going to say it's 1%. Um, the maturity date is two years. You can apply, so how can I apply for the PPP? The administrator in consultation with the secretary determined that no eligible borrower may receive more than one PPP loan. So if you have my understanding of this uh, and addendum A, which I'll show you here shortly, 
Addendum A, when you apply for PPP, actually ask you to list your ownership and all other entities or con uh, independent contractors, sole proprietors, basically any other business. So <clears throat> you can apply for this program. You can apply from one business and that's it. Like you're only eligible for this for, for your one, your one company. That's my understanding. And you have to list out all your other companies. And what this says here is, is the, determine that the no eligible borrower, meaning you as a person may receive more than one PPP loan. Um, when do you have to begin paying principal and interest? So you don't have any payments for six months. And again, here's, here's the language. The interest will continue to accrue on the loans during the six month deferment. The act authorizes the administrator to defer loan payments for up to one year. I would expect that to happen. Can the PPP loan be forgiven? Yes. And this is the, the part where we talked about what you can actually spend it on and how that will be reconciled. So your PPP loan can be forgiven. Um, the amount of loan forgiveness can be up to the full principal amount of the loan and interest. If the borrower, that is, if the borrower will not be responsible for any loan payment, yada, yada. Um, the amount of the loan forgiveness will depend in part on the total amount of payroll cost, payments of interest on mortgage um, incurred before February 15th, rent payments on leases before February 15th, and utility payments under service agreements. Um, while the act provides that borrowers are eligible forgiveness for forgiveness and an amount equal to the sum of payroll cost and any payments of mortgage interest rent utilities, the administrator has determined that the non-payroll portion of the forgivable loan amount should be limited to eff effectuate the core purpose of the statute and ensure the finite program resources are devoted primarily to payroll. So this is where I said, if you go out and buy a bunch of office furniture, you may not have forgiveness. You're gonna to have to account for where these dollars went. Um, but 75% should go to payroll and 25% can go to the other things like mortgage interest, utilities, uh, equipment, regular operating expenses. But as long as you can prove that 75% of the money they gave you went to payroll and the other things were necessary for your business, you're very likely to have this, this all forgiven. And that's not guaranteed, but it, it is very likely. Okay, um, what happens if the funds are misused? If the PPP funds are misused, SBA will direct you to repay these amounts. If you knowingly use them for unauthorized purposes, you may be subject to liability such as fraud, which is what we just talked about. If your shareholders, members, or partners use funds for unauthorized purposes, SBA will have recourse against the shareholder, member, or partner of the unauthorized use. So in summary, just don't be a dummy. Like, don't take the money if you don't need it. And if you do take it, make sure you understand what you should do with it. And you're most likely to be, it'll be forgiven debt. And it, it's going to be simple. But if you take this and go out and buy a new four-wheeler, then you may end up looking like a fool when you have to reconcile all this. Um, so I put this in here too, just so you can see it. So what fees will lenders be paid? On the first 350, they get 5%. From 350 to 2 million, 3%, and above 2 million, 1%. So do the math. You know, if, 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 you, if you go into a community bank and someone right here in your town originates this loan, they can make a 5% origination fee. How many other business loans are they writing right now, by the way? How many of them do you think? So these people need our help, just like we think realtors should be, a, it should be a community of investors and realtors should be members of the community, community businesses, these banks too. So when you go run into the big banks, you're, you're letting that money leave your community. Um, what are the terms and conditions? So the, the loans are guaranteed by the SBA. No collateral is required. No personal guarantees are required. The interest rate is 1%. All loans are processed by lenders <clears throat> that basically your, your local banks. Um, and that may be it. This is 31 pages and we're pretty close to the end. Okay. So I will give you guys some mercy and quit going through my legal document in front of you. The next thing I want to show you is the application for this. It's 
So this is not a great copy because I made it from my iPhone. This is the, the, I wanted to show you the actual package that I picked up at my bank yesterday. This is a regional bank. This is First Citizens Bank, who used to be a small bank, but they've they've uh, they've grown a pretty decent size now. But they act like a community bank. Um, I, can, I literally can walk in there and ask for a line of credit, and they will hand it to me. Um, so they have a sense. So th this bank here, this particular branch in Roanoke, Virginia, has processed fully processed three paycheck protection loans since last Friday. None of the three have funded because they don't have funding instructions. They're not even sure if their bank will be directly funding this or if the money will come from the SBA through their bank to the client or if it'll come from the client to the bank or from the client and the bank is notified. They don't know. Um, other friends on the West Coast, people who applied for this very early are being told the exact same thing. However, um, what you find on the SBA website until last night, a lot of this information wasn't available on the on the SBA site. So the first place I learned it was from my local bank. Um, we're going to go through and look at the application, the paycheck, the PPP application, addendum A, addendum B, a schedule of additional owners, a, calc a loan calculations form, and then what what your payroll documentation. So. For payroll documentation, you have your IRS, your 941, so if you pay quarterlies, um, your 1099 if you're an independent contractor, a Schedule C if you're a sole proprietor, um, and then anything like anything else that you have from payroll services, like if you pay somebody to do payroll. Um, if you're an employee, which I doubt many people on this call actually are, but if you have a W-2, um, and then if you have any reports showing uh, anything about vacation, medical, family, sick leave, uh, group, group benefits, a lot of this stuff probably doesn't apply to, to us. Uh, and then anything that, that if you have cost or payments of state and local, local taxes. Then you'll be asked for a government issued ID, so just a driver's license will be fine. Um, and then your loan submission form and a loan funding authorization form. So this is the full package. Now, I showed you earlier the, the number on the online application for the EIDL. Make sure when you fill out your PPP, make sure it's OMB control number 3245-0407. This form was released last Thursday night and it replaced another contract that, that has a lot of uh, fields that you, you don't wanna waste your time. So make sure you're filling out the right contract. We will link to that so you, you're sure to have the right contract or the right application. Um, in, in the show notes, we will link to it. So wherever you're watching this, look below the video. So this is a pretty simple application. You're going to choose whatever your structure is. Um, for me, I chose to submit this for one of my LLCs. So I chose LLC put in the business name, business address, the EIN, my personal contact information, and then we've already looked at this. So your monthly payroll. So you're going to take the whatever you spent on payroll last year divided by 12 times 2.5 plus the EIDL grant if you have gotten that. Now, if you have gotten that, you'll be the first person in the country. So that pretty much doesn't apply right now. But you might be watching this once that money starts to move. So your, your monthly pay, your gross monthly payroll times two and a half, and that's basically it now, and then how many employees you have. And then you're going to say, I want to use these for the, I'm going to use the funds for the purpose of, and for me, I did payroll and utilities. Um, I run pretty much a virtual business. I don't have a lease or a mortgage and I didn't want to put other. So for me, like I can pay for, you know, internet and cell phone things that would, would, you know, that I normally pay for through the business anyways. Um, next is your applicant ownership. So this company belongs to whom? If any, if you have, if anyone owns more than 20%. Uh, now guys, what I did with this form, I don't want to pull mine up because it has all my personal information, but I found it incredibly hard to write all this stuff into these little tiny f fields. Um, they're not actually that big, especially the address field. What I did is I went to Adobe Acrobat Pro. If you, if you have that software, you can use any other PDF editor. 
but I actually went and I turned, I used blue ink so or blue, blue text. And I would use the text tool. I would go in and put a, put an X or a check mark over the boxes, but I, I actually typed in all of my answers because I, I wanted this to be as easy as possible for the bankers. So what you might try is doing the same because it is kind of hard to write in. And the last thing I wanted was to have my sloppy handwriting be the thing standing in the way of this, right? Um, so next you're just going to answer these questions. Are you, uh, you know, do you have a criminal past? Uh, uh, you know, are there anything that we should know about is this is basically character qualification. Um, or have you gotten the EIDL before April 3rd? And if yes, you need to provide documentation. Well, I mean, let me not skip over that. So have you been in trouble, basically? Um, number one. Number two, have you gotten an SBA loan um, in the last and defaulted in the last seven years? Are you the owner of any business, um, any other business? And this is on number three, I selected yes. And this means, so if you do, if you select yes on number three, you're going to need to have addendum A. And addendum A was something I ended up, I made on my own yesterday before the bank gave me this package. Um, question four, has the applicant received an, an EIDL loan between January 31st and April 3rd? If yes, you need to have an addendum B. I think very few of you actually had the EIDL loans before April 3rd. So most of you are going to be able to skip over this. I think a lot of you will probably have to have uh, addendum A because you have an ownership stake in more than one business. Um, Number five, is the applicant or any individual owning 20% or more subject to an indictment or criminal, yada, yada, are you in trouble with the law? Even if you put no here, you need to make sure that you initial this. Um, so you're, you're, whether it's yes or no, you need to, to confirm your response with your initials. Have you, in the fast, fast five years, um, have you been convicted of a felony, yada, yada? Again, yes or no, and put your initials. Number seven, are you a U.S., basically, is your place of residence for you and all your employees um, in the United States? Yes or no? And are you a franchise? Yes or no? From here, we basically go through just everything, basically saying, I understand all these things. And you just need to read this initial, read initial, read initial, read initial. This is so if, if you ever, if you do go misuse funds, they can point back to this and say, listen, here are your initials saying you understood this and that you're committing fraud if you go misuse the funds. Not much risk there. And then there are instructions for this form. So that is the application. Simple four pages. Oh, that's the last page of it. So it's just a four page application. This is addendum A that my bank provided. Um, they just made like a quick Excel formatted thing here. So this gives you up to four other companies that, and so I did not, when I made, I made my own addendum A because there was no information published at that time. I did not include the NAICS code, number of employees or ownership percentage. So I'll need to go back and, and probably use this template. Um, I just learned most of this at five o'clock yesterday that these, and this is the addendum B that my bank is issuing. So you remember question four, if you have received SB, if you're a recipient of F, FBA, SBA loans between January 31st and April 3rd, you need to write that in here. <laughs> Why there's 30, 30 rows, I don't know, but whatever. So that's your addendum B. Now, this is uh, the schedule of additional owner signers. So this is anyone like, who owns more than 20% of the company that's applying. Most of you will probably be the only owner or you and a spouse. So you'll have two numbers on here or two lines on here. Now, this is your loan submission form that the bank will use to basically summarize everything and submit this application to the SBA. I'm only showing you this so you fully understand like kind of how this happens. And this is also a bank form. So they're going to have, this is basically what they're using to fund. So once you have approval, they'll fill this out and say, okay, you're going to ACH the money here, or you can wire it here. Um, yada, yada. 
So this is a full package. That's, that's actually what's being handed out in paper at the banks right now. And hopefully that was helpful. I will change, let me get my screen back to our slide deck. Okay, so recap here. Uh, we will be posting the sources and resources that we looked at and talked about today will be posted with this recording. So look below the video. Talk to your local banker, so you get the details from them on the SBA loans or grants that you're interested in. And my best advice to you guys, pretty much everybody on this call, I believe should apply for both the EIDL grant and the PPP loan. Um, and you can, I don't know why it, did, it opened an old version of this, but anyways, just as a recap, if you have an entity, if you're an LLC, an S Corp, a corporation, you can apply for the PPP right now. You were eligible as of last Friday at midnight. If you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, gig worker, whatever that title, self-employed, you can apply for, for EIDL right now, but you need to wait until Friday at midnight at least to apply for PPP. All right. Yeah, this is an old slide deck. I don't know what in the world happened there, but this is actually session seven. So I will, let me jump to our Q and A. All right. Let me get this over here so you guys, all right, blue. Blue says, write a letter to your senator on this. SBA is creating their own rules that go against the bill. I agree with you. Um, the, you know, the SBA were, were handed orders and it was with very broad language. And I understand the challenge of that. However, they seem to be kind of making up their own rules. So Blue is recommending you write your senator and, uh, and, and notify them that you're not happy about that. Uh, so with that, let me find you here. Let's see which one. Oh, there it is. Why can't Zoom put everything in one damn window? So with that, I know, I think you didn't have a microphone last time. Um, you are allowed to talk if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, you ask if you'd applied, do you need to apply again? Um, if, if you applied to, no, the answer is probably no. Um, if you applied to the PPP using the old application, then the answer is probably yes. But if you applied to EIDL last Friday, uh, the, the really simple online application, then you don't need to reapply for that. And you're actually just kind of putting an additional load on the system. And some people, you know, think they're, they're, they're being wise asses. They're applying for EIDL every day. Like it's going to help their chances. It's not the damn lottery. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's just putting more, more load on, on the, the people who are tasked with processing all this. So if you applied for PPP using the form that, that we're going to post here, which was the, um, it's the, at the top of the application, Soledad, you should see Paycheck Protection Program, OMB control number 32450407. If you submitted that application, you should not need to apply again. Um, Ellen said, do you know if this is based on adjusted gross income or AGI or taxable income? It's actually based on payroll. Well, I, actually, let me make sure I know which one you're talking about, Ellen. Let me come find you here. Okay, Ellen, you're unmuted on my side if you want to join us. Chad. Hello. Hi, Chad. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so which program were you asking about, EIDL or Paycheck? 
Um, on the paycheck, because I'm an S Corp that only takes a K-1 distribution, I don't W-2 or 1099 myself. Okay, so you're not paying payroll tax at all? Correct. Um, how do you pay yourself? K-1 just, distribution. So you just move money from bank to bank and then It's you, just a straight pass-through. Yeah. So I would use your K-1. Like uh, you're taking a hundred, like whatever you're taking out on the K one, whatever distribution you're taking is going to be your, that'll be your gross payroll amount for this, for this case. Okay. And on the EIDL, then which would it be? Revenue. Okay. You go top, top line revenue. So okay. your, your gross revenue on that one. Okay. And just a comment, um, Bank of America sent emails to all the business relationships saying, if you don't have credit with them, even if you have a business account with them, they're not going to process your PPP. You can't apply through Bank of America. So going through a local bank is a great idea. And I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I'll withhold my opinion on the big five. <laughs> they, they have their purpose, but they're also a big part of this problem. Yes. Agreed. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so I don't think you have a mic, so I'm going to read this. So that said on the page on the PPP, what bank is helping business owners with this application? My current is bank of America, not taking applications. So so that if you respect me and my opinions, take your business banking, go cash out your account and go put your money on deposit with a community bank. They will give you lines of credit. They will make up loans for you. They portfolio loans, especially if you're a real estate investor. Get your money out of big banks and get it into community banks. It, it will serve you. It will serve the bank. It will serve your community. Like quit screwing around with these guys. They're, they're showing you how willing they are to provide service to you right now. So reward that by showing them how willing you are to go find someone who will give you a standard of service that you give everybody else. Um, that said, any FDIC insured bank, I like, I like small community banks under $3 billion dollars. Um, just because they, you have real relationships, you can walk in and say, listen, Frank, I need this. What can you do for me? And they'll sit down and put something together for you. And a lot of people say, well, that's not true. That doesn't happen. You know, we walked into Tennessee four weeks ago. We went into a town we'd never been to, walked into a community bank that's in a Victorian house, coolest bank I've ever seen, and basically laid out $6.8 million worth of loans, which is a big loan portfolio for such a small bank. But they, they wanted to, you know, we want to integrate in the communities. We want to work with the housing authority. We want to work with community banks. And like, it was that easy. So don't struggle with these big guys. Take you and, you know, by the, just go over there and take your money and, and put it in a, in a community bank and say, I'm here to do some banking today. Um, Steve said, any indication the second stimulus, which appears to focus on health insurance, will also have another round of PPP, uh, particularly as the period goes until 30th of June. So, Steve, I think, uh, let me find you here in case you want to jump in. Uh, Steve, you're uh, permitted to talk if you would like to. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, extensions or continuations of this. I don't know what it looks like. I haven't seen anything for sure. But I, I think the government has certainly proven they're willing to do whatever it takes to, to, keep, thing, to keep liquidity and keep things moving and keep businesses open. So, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> just a, a few weeks ago, $10 billion or $350 billion seemed like an exorbitant amount of money, right? Like, wow, that's a lot. But now, I mean, we've, we've printed so many trillions already. It's like, wow, 350 billion is not going to go very far. So I think that you'll see more money allocated to this, um, especially once they kind of get some footing and, and can handle the processing and they start funding some of these, then they'll have time to go back and catch a breath and say, okay, what, what else needs to be done here? Um, and I don't think some people think our, we're just going to flip a switch and our economy comes back online and small businesses will be just fine and all their employees will come back to work and be happy. Um, I, I, I like that utopian view, but I seriously don't think that's what it's going to look like. So I think the government's going to have to step in and backstop some of these businesses um, with additional resources.
Um, so Soledad said the loan does not include Social Security, Medicaid, uh, yada, yada. You can't use that money to pay those expenses. It's my understanding, and, uh, and, and if you look at that document, it actually, <clears throat> it's my understanding that you can go ahead and pay your payroll taxes with this money. So your FICA, like if you're, if you're making payroll as normal, you can use the, the PPP money to make your normal payroll as you normally would including FICA. Um, Nikki said, ask, will they accept a 1099 to show funds received for yourself as self-employed? Yes, Nikki, you'll be able to, uh, for your supporting documentation with the PPP application, instead of if you don't have, you know, payroll form, if, yes, the 1099 will, will be accepted. Yeah, so Renee, Hollywood, you're unmuted if you want to join us. <laughs> yes, um, I understand everything that you talked about today, but was there something around an unemployment? Um, I didn't talk about that today. That was uh, heavily talked about on Friday. Friday, and okay. You, you do qualify for unemployment. What's happening to a lot of realtors is that their state is actually, you know, every state determines eligibility and the amount that's paid out. And they all have their own rules. Um, I did give you guys a resource after Friday's session that shows you exactly what your state does and the websites and where to go to apply. But what, what's happening to a lot of real estate professionals is they're actually getting apply, uh, approved for 0% state unemployment. However, having applied and getting a $0 benefit from the state makes you eligible for $600 per week from the federal government. And that's good through, I believe. I think June? I believe no. July, June 30th. Like it's good until July 1st, I think. It might be July 31st. But so you're eligible for at least $2,400 a month from the federal government, even if California doesn't give you, if they give you a $0 allocation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's July 31st from what I read. Yeah, I think all so. Right. So should I just go back and if I don't listen to all of Friday, is there just the, um, like in the show notes where to click throughs yeah, for EDD? Links. Let me, um. There's a, um, a PDF that I linked to that Chad put together and it has all the summaries and the loan applications. Um, I'll also include that in today's recap with this episode awesome. too. Okay, thank you again. Yeah, just so everybody sees. Kat, you see my, no, maybe not. So many windows. Okay, Kat, now you see Facebook? I do. All right, guys, so if you go to All the Leads Mastermind, um, this is where we're posting. You can see we're live here right now. Um, this is where we post a lot of these calls. So session five is the one you're looking for. And we have a you can also use the topics on the right hand side and click shift happens and it'll give you all seven so far of the posts. Look at you cat. So organized. There we go. That is a way better way to do this. Um, so session six, session five. So here you go, Renee. This is what you're looking for. Ah, thank you. There you go. So this is the show notes. Kat does a great job keeping everything in here. There's a lot of links and a lot of stuff to go through. Just slow down, take your time and, and go through it. But yeah, so anyone who's wondering where to find all this stuff we've been referencing, uh, Facebook is uh, pl one place. The other thing, if you want to, another, more, maybe a more efficient way for some of you, if you go to youtube.com forward slash all the leads, this is our YouTube channel. And if you go to playlists, you'll actually see there's a playlist for shift happens as well. And in here, you'll also have a lot of the notes. So wherever you like to consume, uh, we try to post in as many places as possible so you can have access to that. And while you're here, check out the other playlists. We've got, you know, a lot of folks, if you're in probate, like if you're working probate already, our tips from the trainer and Ask the Expert series, um, there's a lot of great content here, guys. We have over 700 hours of, of content. 
and people watch four days of actual watch time every single day on this channel just learning about uh, probate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Um, Dennis, good question. Dennis said, what if I haven't filed my 2019 taxes? Um, good for you. You're smart. You're supposed to file taxes on October 15th as a business owner. Um, just so you know, if you don't know this, the April 15th filing deadline has been extended to July 15th. And obviously you can still file an extension to carry you to October 15th. Just a tip if you want to keep some cash in your business. Um, but if you have not filed your 2019 return, they will use your 2018 return. Um, they are accepting last year's returns. Um, David just typed Chad. So let me see, David, if you're, if you're here. Get more stuff in one window here. Dave Bick, you're uh, allowed to talk if you want to join. Um, all I got was Chad comma, so I didn't get your full question. Um, Ray asked, if you have more than one company, can you apply for EIDL for each of those companies? Absolutely, you, you can. So submit, submit as many applications as, as you have entities. Now, if you have entities that, you know, if, if, you, if they're just pass-throughs and they don't actually perform much of a business function, um, you might not be, you might not be granted the loan, but go ahead and apply anyways. When I talked to that advice came to me from the SBA representative at the university of central Florida three weeks ago, when I called, she's like, none of us know what's happening. Apply for everything from every entity you have and hope for the best. And I'm like, all right, well, that sounds official to me. So I will pass that advice from the SBA along to you, Ray. Uh, yeah, so Soledad, you applied already for EIDL. There's no point in applying again. It's just going to put more of a, a drag on the system. Uh, Rachel said, for the EIDL, do you apply online, not with the bank? Or Rochelle, I'm sorry. Uh, so Rochelle, yes. And there's a link actually over in the chat from the very near the beginning. I actually dropped that link. Uh, it's the covid19relief.sba.gov. That that link is the one you're looking for. And actually, just so I know you got it, I can drop this to you as an answer. There you go. Um, so Margie, let me find you here. That's interesting. Well, Margie, I don't, there's another Margie here, but it's Margie Burroughs. I don't know. Margie Wallen, if you're watching this recording, it looks like I can't see you right now, but uh, Margie said she's not going out for another month. Can you only get the forms at the bank? No, you can get the forms. I'm going to send you a link to the actual SBA forms. But I'm also going to send you, I'll send you this package from my bank. And it's, it, you know, everyone's going to be looking for the same thing. So there's nothing that says First Citizens Bank other than this, this very first page, which is just the instructions. But everything else that I'll send you in, in this package um, will, will be, everything you need will be there. So you'll be able to apply with that at, at any, any bank. And what I would recommend is, I mean, you can even mail it in. So, you know, if you mail it today, probably Monday or Tuesday, they're going to get it. Um, or you could have, if there's, you know, if, if that's probably sufficient and just mail it to your bank. Um, Carolyn says, so as an independent contractor, can I apply for the PPP even though I do not have any employees? Yes. For the purpose of this program, you are considered an employee, even if you're not paying yourself payroll. Um, however you pay yourself is how you're going to back it up and show 
how you pay yourself, even if that's a bank statement where you show that I wrote, literally, if you write a check to yourself from one account to another, they're, they're willing to accept that. Um, John, it says, do realtors qualify for any of these? Also, with the percentage calculation, anything that makes about 20000 last year might not qualify for anything. John, I don't quite understand that, man. Let me see if I can find you here. I think you might have meant 200000 Okay. Um, there's two Johns right here side by side. So John Fee, if it was you, you're allowed to talk. And John Day, if it was you, you're allowed to talk. If you guys want to join the conversation, I don't quite understand your question as written. Hey, Chad, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, John. How are you? I'm good. How about you? Good, good. So the emergency application on, on SBA website that says uh, people can get up to $10,000 as a grant before the loan application. Yep. So I'm wondering, another fine print says uh, one can only get uh, up to 50% of last year income. So 10,000 being the 50% of 20,000, so if the 10,000 grant is granted, so most likely another loan might not be granted. Does it worth applying knowing that information? Yes, because what if they just give you 10 grand? Mm -hmm. It's six, six minutes of effort with no recourse for $10,000. Mm -hmm. You don't really have anything to lose, do you? Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, old dad. Kathy. Uh do you use both do you use gross commissions for both applications? I am an independent contractor. Um so Kathy, it depends on let me see if you're here. It depends on how you pay yourself on the PPP. Kathy, you are allowed to talk if you would like to. I um, I pay myself directly. It's a direct deposit from my company, and I just pay my bills out the same account. Okay, so you just have you run one banking account, or you run two bank accounts? You have a company, you have a business account and a personal. No, I just have one account. Okay, yeah. So you're. I mean, it's going to be hard to say what you, I mean, you're paying yourself 100% of gross commissions. Right. So yes. You can basically take your 1099 from your broker and that's your, okay. that's, that's your payroll. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill said, did I, Bill Hughes, did I hear correctly? The PPP application is a paper form. Yes, Bill, that is correct. And we will be providing that for you in the show notes below this video. Carolyn said Chase Bank offered for her to apply online for the PPP, but they were requesting other documents like a W-2, quarterlies, 940s, 41s, and 44s. Is this the same program? Yes. Um, that means they've probably gotten their own form up. Um, so yes, you, if you can apply online, I don't know why other banks haven't done that, but yes, that is, that is correct. Um, just answered that one. Carolyn said, should I take the paper application to a local bank? That would be my suggestion. That way you know that it made it and you know that it got put in the pile. Um, NZ, it's fine. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm being pretty tough on some of the big banks. You can, you can apply wherever you would like and don't feel like you have to go to a community bank. I'm just saying I support them. Um, so Dennis asked, can I apply for both unemployment and the EIDL loan? Yes, you can. Joyce. 
Will my income from real estate investment, such as flipping, warehousing, and rents from my tenants be considered wages? Yes. And Joyce, let me come find you and see how you're paying yourself. Hey, Joyce, you're allowed to join if you would like. Um, so Joyce, I don't know if you have a microphone. It looks like you're unmuted actually. Um, yeah. So as far as, as that being counted as wages, so it depends on how you pay yourself as you heard from the last, the last caller. Uh, okay. I see Joyce, no microphone. Um, if you're paying yourself payroll, then you would actually use the, the amount of your actual payroll. If you're taking 100% of the money out of the business and considering that your payroll, then you would issue, you would need to back that up with proof. Um, but how, what, however you would prove that to your CPA for, for income on taxes is how you would prove it to the bank on, on this application. Like if that's your payroll. Alejandro, let me find you here, man. All right, Alejandro, you can uh, join us whenever you're ready. You're unmuted on my side. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What's up? Hey, uh, nice to nice to see you. So, what is going on is, is basically that I, I basically uh, started doing real estate on my own for 2019. Um, didn't do only did one closing. However, I got my skills up and at the beginning of this year, I started to list three, four properties per month. Uh, out of this, basically only one uh, closed, the other, you know, are now in limbo. Um, my savings are gone because I spent them last year. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. All right, let's talk about the three that, that you, it sounds like you haven't completely let go of those. Why did those three unravel or why are they unraveling? Oh, what do you mean those three? Well, you said you had four and one of them closed and three were, had come off the rails. You didn't say they had canceled. Did they cancel? Like the contracts were canceled? Right, two contracts, two contracts got canceled. So what has been going on is that since January 2020, I have started to list about three, four properties per month. Mm -hmm. um, out of the basically uh, 10 that have been listed, only one closed. One is still under contract, which is uh, actually a probate. And then the other two, they fell off the, the rails. Uh, they got canceled. Why? Uh, one of them, just the inspection period didn't quite mm -hmm. happen. The second one, uh, they put it on the, on the mortgage is saying that they that the person wouldn't qualify but it was because i, I okay. that, yeah Let me, i want to get my screen up here that's that's what i wanted to hear so like bird in the hands were two in the bush would you agree yeah so i'm going to show you and in case you missed this um last uh, i don't know what day it was i don't even know what day it is today um on session which one was it? Session four of Shift Happens. This is on YouTube, but if you go over here to Facebook, it's probably a little easier to see. Um, we did an hour long session on creative financing. And we, we talked about seven specific ways that you can keep deals together in the situation you're going through. So I would encourage you to go watch that first. Mm -hmm. And write down ideas like, like think about those two deals that fell apart. And, and think about how you, oh man, he just said something I could have, maybe I could have saved that one that way. And if you're in over your head, then call support. Um, I don't know, I thought, thought I gave you my screen, but if not, here it is. Um, so shift happens session four is the one you're looking for. Um, if you watch this and you feel like you're in over your head, call support uh, at the main number on our website or email support at all the leads.com and ask them to elevate, elevate you to my calendar and we'll go through it. And if I'm understanding correctly, you still have nine active listings, correct? I have seven, seven. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So there's things we can do for those seven uh, to make them more attractive, uh, depending, depending on what the situation is. So uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when you go through this creative financing session. Um, I think this was like two hours. So go through that first. Um, if you still have a lot of questions or you need help, uh, contact support and ask them to elevate you to my calendar and I'll spend some time with you one-on-one. -on -one. Oof, thank you. And then, uh, Chad, in regards to these loans or anything um, that the government is, the stimulus as a whole, do you believe there is anything that I can apply to? Absolutely, man. Like you, I mean, you're, you're, you know, what's going to hurt you on the, the PPP is you haven't been able to pay yourself a whole lot because you haven't had that many closings. So you're, you're going to get a limited benefit there. You should also unemploy, you should apply for state unemployment insurance. And that will give you at least $600 a week from the federal government and potentially something from the state. Um, so you don't have to be completely without an income. If I were you, swing for the fence, man. Go apply for all of it because you are going through a hardship. And it's, you know, I mean, you don't have anything in the pipeline now. So you pretty much know you're not getting paid for 60 to 90 days, right? Yep. So you need these loans more than anyone. So go apply for EIDL today apply for PPP to, uh, Friday and apply for state unemployment insurance today. And hopefully in the next four to six weeks, you know, that you'll see some money from one of those resources. Um, the quickest, the quickest will, you know, could be state unemployment, but they are, they are giving realtors $0. They'll, they'll approve them, but it's a $0 benefit. And I don't, I haven't applied for anything from an unemployment perspective, but, I don't know how quickly the federal checks are coming, but that's probably your fastest funding is going to be the unemployment. And then hopefully the EIDL, um, you know, that was supposed to be a three day turnaround, but it hasn't proven to be that quick, but that should be your midterm. And then probably the PPP will back you up long-term. Um, it could be weeks before they fund, you know, those programs, but it's coming. So go ahead and take, take your position, apply now. Makes sense. Thank all you right, so man. much. Keep your head up. Keep running toward the obstacle. That's the only way to get through this, all right? Yep, you got it. All right, who's up now? Hey, Margie, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't find you. I don't know why. Oh my goodness. We have, um, Giovanni says, I run an LLC and pay myself payroll as an employee. Can I apply now or wait till Friday? So Giovanni, you want to go apply today. Uh, take the PPP application to a local bank and drop it off. That way you've got your application in before the flood of sole proprietors and independent contractor applications come through. Um, on Friday, they're really going to have their assets handed to them. Um, Rochelle, we answered that. You can apply for both. Carolyn has a question. Let me find you here, Carolyn. Hey, Carolyn. Uh, oops. There you go. Now you can talk whenever you're, whenever you want to join us. Can you hear me? Can hear you loud. Okay. How are you today? Very good. And I wanted to just share my gratitude with you. I actually joined the probate like at the perfect timing because not only am I learning a new skill, but you're like the beacon of light guiding me through this entire situation right here. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm glad that means a lot to me. Yeah. And I've been able to share it with colleagues of mine and stuff. So it's really, really blessed a lot of people. So I just thank you for everything you're doing. Well, thank you for your kind words. Anything I can do to help you specifically today? Yes. Okay. So I had, you answered my question that uh, Chase made it available for us to apply online because I have a business account with them. Yeah. But I, I have, the way my business is set up is I'm a, basically a full-time realtor, but I have it under an LLC with an S corporation. Yep. So yep. I basically just have a business account and then I transfer money over to my personal account for 
you know, my bills and stuff like that. So I don't have like a payroll or anything like that set up. So when the, when I did the one on Chase, it was very awkward. Like it, like the questions and, and the way that they were putting everything was, it, it felt like I didn't fit in the application. So I just. So basically what they're going to look at is, and, and I'll tell you this, Carolyn, you need to like your, your, your business structure, your entity structure is correct. Like it's the most beneficial from a legal and a tax standpoint. You, you've, you've gotten good advice. You've structured it correctly. However, you do need to start paying yourself payroll. Um, okay. Especially in times like this is where it, it, it makes the most, you really need that. It's a pain in the butt, but I, I, I had to go through this about three years ago. I was doing exactly what you're doing. I had single member LLCs with the box check. So they were taxed as S corps and I was just taking distributions and running loose. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you're costing yourself money. Like if you're making over a hundred and eight, $132,000 a year, you are costing yourself money in taxes. Now it feels like it's going to the U S government, but there's, there's, if you structure it properly, like, the payroll, the, the, like you only pay FICA up to $132,800, I think. And then from there, you don't have to pay that. So you're saving roughly 7% above that. Um, so there, there, are, you, there is, there's, there's money to be saved if you pay payroll, um, especially if you're doing over $150,000 a year in revenue. Um, so so I, would I would encourage you to. Yeah. <laughs> that'd, be like a 2020, that'd be like a 2020 goal to get that set up. Yeah. So it's not that hard and you can even do it retroactively for this year. You can do retroactive payroll back through the first quarter. Um, when I first got my ducks in a row, like when I, when I finally decided to have some discipline and set it up correctly, um, it was in April and I, I was able to go back and do retroactive payroll and then just submit the, the 941s retroactively. And uh, I had to pay a penalty because, you know, it was basically in the second quarter, I was submitting my first quarter payroll. So they hit me with, I don't know, $50 penalties or something like that. But a, a good bookkeeper or CPA can certainly take care of that for you. And I just have like, I, I pay myself a set amount and I have it auto pay from one bank account to the other. And then a bookkeeper does the, the payroll on it. Okay. Okay. So what, um, what, so what they're going to be looking for. Scenario? Yeah, what they're going to be looking for from you is, okay, Carolyn, how do you pay yourself? And you're going to say, well, I do it uh, transfer. So your bank statement is basically going to serve as your, your payroll proof right now. Okay. And then, and then I guess where I was confused was the one like you like you just mentioned that you're, you can, some people can start applying on Friday for the independent contractors. You're, so you're eligible right now because you're an S corp. Because I'm an S corp, okay. Yep. And um, and then the other question I had is if let's pretend that I didn't apply, could I have taken this paper application and gone to a local community sure. bank? Sure. Even even though I my business account is with Chase. Doesn't matter. And like here's the deal, guys. All these banks are overwhelmed. If you want to fill out ten of these applications and go drop them off at ten different banks, that's fine they have an incentive to get these things processed because of the fat fees that I showed you. So, you know, what, what should matter most to you is getting it to a bank that you know will process the damn thing. If the bank's overwhelmed, then, then they're not going to be very helpful to you. And the, the, the SBA could run out of money before your bank gets their act together. And that's what's kind of makes me so upset about some of these bigger banks. You know, they, 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 just haven't stepped up and served where these small banks are running three shifts of people processing these things and keying them in so they can support the businesses. So if you're not getting what you need from your bank, go to another one. And if that one, if ever, if all the banks seem busy, just fill out 10 applications and drop them off at 10 different banks. It won't hurt you. I'm going to try that. And then last thing is the unemployment. I heard you mention a couple of times, um, I'm in the state of Florida, so they've had like a huge nightmare with just the system itself, you know, actually applying. But when I went on there and looked at the application, it just seemed, again, very like awkward, like I didn't fit in the application. Like, it just was like, what, what, you know, you were laid off. I'm not really laid off. 
Yeah. And it's tough. Like we're all, you know, we're all conditioned to fill out forms and, and, and a certain way you kind of have to forget everything that you've been conditioned to, to believe on loan applications and unemployment and things like that. Like if you don't have an income, if you don't have closings in the pipeline, then technically you are an unemployed realtor, right? So even and what if, if you do have the, deals in the pipeline, what is that? Is that, should I not be applying for unemployment? Do you have closings this way? So for me, that, that's, that was an ethical call that I made personally. Um, I have a good, I'm very blessed um, that you guys support me. And, and, you know, we have, I have income from my training and from all the leads. So even though I'm unemployed as a realtor right now, because I don't have any, I had an 860 house deal at the table and the damn thing blew up. It was like a $90 million transaction. Um, so I, I'm technically unemployed as a realtor, but I have chosen not to take unemployment insurance just because I don't want to put pressure. I have multiple streams of revenue, right? And I don't want to put pressure on a system that's already overloaded. So you just have to look at your own values and, and decide, but you are eligible. And even if they, even if the state of Florida gives you a $0 benefit, you can still get the $600 a week from the federal government. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Good luck with all this. All right, guys. I don't think I'm going to get to everybody today, but I'm going to do my best. Um, Sylvia said, since it's up to 10,000, there's any formula they use on the EIDL to calculate between the gross expense you determine. So Sylvia is asking, how do they determine how much of the $10,000 you're eligible for on EIDL? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Nobody knows. Um, right now, there's no communication. Like I said, I applied, all I've gotten was, I took a screenshot of my confirmation number. No emails, no mail, like I haven't gotten anything. So it, your guess is as good as mine. Some people are saying that they can give you as little as $1,000. Other people are saying that they're going to fund the full 10,000 and, you know, at that case, they'll be out when they fund the first 1 million of them, they're out of funds. So right now I haven't been able to get the answer and I haven't been able to find anybody, you know, for, for me to stand up here and act like I like to give you guys these answers. I've done everything I can to find people who can answer these questions and that's one I just can't get answered. So I'm sorry. Don't know. Thanks Rochelle. Um, Irina says, so Irina, I think we've answered your question. Um, Irina said, uh, I'm an independent contractor, real estate agent. I do not have a business account checking or savings. I contacted my bank. They said I would not qualify. Do you know anything about that? If only people with regular checking accounts would qualify. So yes, my understanding of this, based on the language that I showed you that was highlighted in that bill earlier, even if you don't have formal documentation like payroll forms and 1099s and Schedule, one, schedule Cs or K1s, like however you would prove if, if you were, like, I mean, this is a bad example, but if you were going through a divorce and you had to prove to your attorney how you were paying yourself, what would you do? How would you back that up? I think they're going to be that it, it might be that casual. They may accept the bank statements, um, 1099s from your broker, like the, the 1099 your broker sends you, maybe even commission stubs, like where you pull your check apart. Whatever you can prove that to pay yourself, like what you were paying yourself and that that no longer exists, you should be able to, to use that as proof and get two and a half times that much. Um, all right, guys, I have to jump a little bit early today because we do have the role play call coming and then I have a session right after that. So I'll try to get to everybody. Um, Ray, on your EIDL application, you are at least one employee. So don't put zero, put one. Um, Scott, I don't understand. 
he said it's, so scott is is running as a, as a, a realtor within an llc but his broker doesn't provide a 1099 um what you can i mean you're going to use tax returns like your schedule c um i'm assuming is, is what you're reporting on your tax returns that'll show what you what you earned last year and you can use bank statements to show what you're paying yourself if you're not on payroll um so joyce that's a good question joyce said if i get zero amount from state unemployment where and how do i apply for the 600 for the federal government you don't have to worry about it as long as the state approves you for a zero dollar benefit then they will basically send the order through the state or the federal government is just overlaying on everybody who's currently eligible for state so you don't have to do a federal unemployment application my understanding is that when the state approves you for ui benefits then the, the federal reserve the, excuse the federal government will include that 600 a week on top of that Thank you so much, Kathy. I, I see your compliment. Um, Steve said, I formed my LLC last week, or excuse me, last July, and didn't take any 1099 wages the rest of the year. We are 50% partners and took a small K-1. Is that what I would use for payroll in the application? Um, if you haven't taken any other income out of it, like whatever you paid yourself um, last year, Take that number, divide by 12, multiply by 2.5, and that's your number, what you're eligible for. Um, yeah, and Michael, we just, uh, just answered that one about the $600 federal. Um, Kiki said, my rental income expenses are included in my 1099. Do I have to take those number, take out those numbers when I complete the form? Um, but think about it this way. I mean, anything that you're not actually paying yourself. I mean, we all have, you know, unique structures of how we get paid, but think about, you know, if you are explaining to the banker exactly how you paid yourself and what that amount was, um, if you, if you wouldn't normally show him that 1099, if you would show him something else, then that's, that's kind of the answer. Um, okay. So let me catch up on the chat here, guys. I, it's hard to keep up with everything with five windows. Let me make sure we've cleared questions over here. Um, Ellen Griffith said her broker told her to put on the, on the EIDL application, her broker told her to put zero on the cost of goods. Uh, was that incorrect? My understanding of that, you know, your, your cost of goods in real estate is basically your operating expenses. Um, I actually put in my gross revenue and my operating expenses. Um, So Michael, I think we we just answered. Your, uh, I saw I got you in the questions box. Michael said, "What do you suggest if we just started a new LLC in 2019? We were in startup phase for short-term rentals, and had to cancel leases in February. Um, you know, for paycheck protection, it's going to be tough as as a startup. If you weren't paying yourselves, uh, it's going to be tough to get any kind of benefit. You should definitely apply for EIDL." And you should say, you know, I'm guessing in your first year building a short-term rental portfolio, you probably had negative negative equity. So um, you could say, you know, we made twenty thousand dollars in income and had eighty-five thousand dollars in expenses. Um, those would be the two things you would report. So twenty thousand dollar gross income or yeah, gross uh, revenue, and then. Uh, eighty thousand dollars in cost of goods and that's going to show your distress obviously but that entity is it is old enough you are eligible so i would certainly apply um So Scott said, I spoke to a lender at a community bank last night who was recommended by my accountant. He said, since I operate as a pass-through business and don't pay myself via a recurring payroll per se, that I do not qualify for PPP. 
Um, that's what I'd mentioned earlier, Scott. Like if you, if you have a pass through entity, that's, that's just that, like if it doesn't actually have its own books, if it doesn't have expenses and the income, like if it doesn't have its own bank account and things like that, you're, 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 you're probably not going to get approved for that. But ultimately, I mean, the, the money's coming somewhere. So even if, if, you know, if you are a, a contractor of that company, however you're getting paid, if that pay, if that stopped coming, you can use bank accounts, uh, check stubs. I mean, they're being really lenient with what they're accepting as proof of, of payroll. So I would still apply. Um, you might not get, you know, it, 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 the loan might not be, you might not get it under the entity. You may apply as Scott on Friday versus Scott's LLC today. Um, but you know, the idea here is not to, and the idea is to get as much money out as possible to the people who deserve it, but to be able to audit that and make sure it wasn't abused. So we're, nobody's trying to keep you out in the cold because of the way you're structured. You may just have to apply personally versus through your entity. Uh, Margie, yes, Kat will have this posted as soon as we finish up here today. It'll be posted in our Facebook group and on YouTube. Um, Ellen, I think we handled yours. Um, Yvonne asked about the form number. Yvonne, and we'll post that in the show notes. Um, Belinda Reese, we talked about this. Uh, I'm just seeing Kat had, had posted your question from Facebook. I'm pretty sure you've, you've probably heard the answer by now, but uh, Belinda is saying if we're an independent, a realtor and we simply cash and spend our commissions, can we simply show commissions earned or how do we handle the payroll proof? You're most likely you're going to, you're going to show the 1099 from your broker and your bank statements. Um, Michael, yes. So I'm, I, you do count yourself as an employee. So every entity should have at least one employee. Um, Alex said PPP and EIDL are the same thing. Are, are they the same thing for sole proprietors? No, they're, they're two different things. And I won't, in the interest of time, you can, you can go back up to the review at the beginning of the session, but you know, as a sole proprietor, you, you are eligible for both, but they're, they are different programs. Um, Andrew, we got to you. Yeah, so that's actually a really good point. Um, for anyone who started taking action on this several weeks ago, Blue had said, if you apply for the EIDL on a non-online form, I was told by an SBA rep, you'll need to reapply. So let's talk about both programs. For EIDL, that remember, that was an existing program that's been around for years. It's mainly for natural disasters. So there were there were applications sitting out there when this kind of when when the CARES Act was first signed in the in the law, everyone like ran to, to apply for these programs, including myself. And I was, you know, crashing websites and it didn't work on Chrome. You had to do it from from uh, Firefox or from Safari. And it was just a damn mess. Well, even if you applied, if you took four to five hours to struggle through that and fill out that application, it's basically junk now. Because when they issued the really sleek form that I showed you, that simple five-step form for EIDL, that became the application. So if you filled out an old EIDL application and you're waiting for benefits, you need to know you have to go fill out the new sleek streamlined form, the one that we're going to link to in the, in the show notes here. So thank you for reminding me of that, Blue. Thank you, Angela. So that's a good question. Karen says, Chad, what do you include in your credibility packet for the Tennessee bank to support your business needs? It's this right here. So we literally walked in and I mean, just casual clothes. I was wearing a pair of boots and jeans and we walked in and sat down and, and basically just showed them who we were. 
I learned a long time, you know, when I was 25 years old, I walked into community banks in East Tennessee when Wells Fargo, GMAC, and Countrywide pulled almost a half a billion dollars worth of funding they had committed. That's, that was the, the beginning of my wake up call when it came to big banks. And I walked into the lobby and I, I, I said, I'm here to see the bank president. And I sat there, some, usually no more than 15 minutes. But in the first two days, I was able to raise $42 million from community banks with eye contact and a handshake. You don't need a bunch of documentation and everything. What you need is to be confident in what, you, what you're delivering to the community and know how to, to deliver that. Because community banking is based on real relationships and they're, they're looking at what is this person's character and what is their risk and what is the, the opportunity for me to be able to support them as they build something in the community and I, that advances me through my career. And it's so people based. That's why I like it. So, you know, as far as a community bank, walk in and say, listen, I'm, we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z. What I recommend everybody do, if you want to start a relationship with a community bank, start it with at least a $10,000 deposit. And if you don't understand how lending works, so they, they basically get nine to one leverage on that. So if you deposit $10,000, then all of a sudden they can lend out a hundred thousand dollars if, because they have the reserves. So, I like when I first moved to Roanoke, I took, I think, 30 grand and split it across three community banks, built relationships with each of them. Instead of it was way simpler to just put my money in one bank. But I wanted to have those relationships and the flexibility of three different banks. So you don't need a, a whole bunch of, of collateral to take with you if you can just walk in and be convincing and be confident in, in who you are as a business person. That's usually all it takes. All right. Uh, Michael, yes. If you get a $0 benefit from the state, you still get your federal. Um, so Ellen Griffith is no longer here. It looks like she had to jump, but she said the California Association of Realtors is telling us to wait and apply for unemployment because EDD hasn't been figured out or oh, excuse me, EDD hasn't figured out how to process this yet. They are expecting a different application. So if you're in California, go look at the uh, California Association of Realtors. They are apparently offering some leadership on this. Um, Michael, you do not have to apply at the federal level. Yeah, so Tim, the, the, EI, um, the EIDL app, the number that you gave, the 32450406, that is correct. That is the current EIDL form. The other number that you meant that you put here, the 32450407, that is the most current version of the PPP application. And yes, this is recorded and it will be posted as soon as we're done here today. Um, Irene, I'm going to do, um, so Irene is saying she's having trouble finding a bank that will do it if they don't have a checking or savings account. So Irene, what I would recommend is pull a hundred bucks out of your purse and say, there, open my account and, and then have them, <laughs> have them do it. And I think, you know, I mean, I know folks, that's just a thing. I've always, I always keep banking relationships and I keep, you know, because you never know, like I, I plan, I think I, I must think differently, but I spread money across banks just for reasons like this. Like if one is overwhelmed or can't handle things, I can always go somewhere else. So um, guys, I'm going to jump. I have to get ready for uh, our role play call. If you guys are probate experts, it's hard to tell who finds their way to these calls, but 
If you are serving families going through probate, we have a live probate role play call starting in nine minutes. And I've missed a couple calls from Jim. So I am going to go. Thanks a lot, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to run right now. So if anyone didn't get their questions answered, uh, let's continue the conversation over on Facebook. You can jump on to All the Leads Mastermind, our private group, and uh, we'll continue the conversation there. Thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.